Well, let me stop the recording. So yesterday what we did is we went ahead and worked on our application which is called as the, uh, the application name we want warehouse application and in that warehouse application we created two objects. One is called as the invoice object we created and the another object that we created was a merchandise object. So with these objects, we saw how to create objects, how to add the fields, what are the different types of fields, etc. So we're going to go ahead and take this application to the next level today. So now what we have here is, let's say um, right now we do not know that, okay, which particular invoice object is related to which particular product, right? Merchandise is like, you can think like a product. So invoices, let's say, how much how many products did you bought, what was the cost of each of the product, etc. And that's what the invoice will have. And the merchandise will be one particular product, let's say you bought a laptop and you bought a TV, etc. So that's what a merchandise is. So right now we do not have any kind of relationship between an invoice and merchandise. So first thing what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and establish a relationship between these two objects. So what we're going to do is we are going to create another object and the name of the object is called as the line item object. Okay, And what this line item object would be, we will create a relationship between a line item and an invoice object and we will also create a relationship between a line item and a merchandise object. So this is what we are going to do. So before, so what is a relationship? Relationship is basically when you wanted to uh, when you wanted to relate the records of one object with the another object, right? You wanted to see that okay, invoice number 0001 has these many products in it. Okay, the person bought one laptop, one um, computer, etc. So this is in. So we wanted to create something like this. So if you wanted to relate the object of one rec the records of one object to the another object, then what we do is we create a relationship. Before jumping into the relationship, we always need to see about what is a parent object and what is a child object. Okay, we will have to see what is a parent object and what is a child object. And always, another point to remember is always, always the relationship field always goes on the child object. Okay, so first thing, whenever you're establish, establishing a relationship, you need to make sure what is the parent in that relationship and what is the child in that relationship, okay? That is one thing that you have to make sure. And once you have made sure that, okay, a child or the relationship, the, the child is this object and parent is this object, then the relationship field will always go on the child object. Now, in another way to remember this is, let's say, Whenever you fill a form or anything, as a, as a children, you always ask to what was your parents, right? You need to have information about the parent. So always the relationship field will go on the parent, on the child object because a child should know where he's coming from. So how we will decide who is a parent and who is a child? So one very simple way is to decide, okay, like a one-to-many relationship, let's say. One to many. So that is where, so wherever there is a many, many will be the child object and wherever there is a one, that becomes the parent object. So for example, in our case, what we have is, let's say, in our case, we are trying to create a relationship between the invoice object and the next object called a line item. So one particular, one particular invoice can have multiple line items associated with it. Okay multiple items, right? One invoice can have multiple items associated with it, right? So here the invoice object becomes the parent object and the, the, the line item becomes the child object, okay? So this one becomes the parent object and this one becomes the child object. Now similarly, let's take another example where let's say we have a, uh, we have a manager and then we have an employees. Okay, so in this case, as you know that one particular manager can have multiple employees working under him, right? But you cannot have one employee does not have two managers, right? You can yeah, you can have a different types of manager, but it's not like there's not a, a straight line between hierarchy between. Uh, so one manager can have multiple employees working under him. So in this case, what who will become the parent? The manager is the parent here, and the employee becomes the 
child object. Okay, so we have established there's a one-to-many relationship between this object and this object, and uh, then there is a there is a the, who is the parent in this case? Manager becomes the parent, and the employee becomes the child. Similarly, let's say in America, we all everyone has a uh, has a family physician, right? So one particular doctor can have multiple patients under him, right? He's can treating multiple patients, but one particular patient will have a one family doctor. So in this case also, there is a relationship between these two objects where the doctor is the parent object and the, the patient is like a child object. Right? So anytime I wanted to create a relationship field, now the relationship field can be of different types. One is the, it, so the relationship field will always go on the child object. Now you can create different kinds of relationship on an object. One is considered as a lookup relationship you can create. And the second type of relationship we have is a master detail relationship. There is a third type which is also called as hierarchical relationship. But this type of relationship is only available in case of the user object. You will not see a hierarchical relationship and any other object besides a user object. So I will tell you what does that mean. So you have these different types of relationship that you can create. You can create a lookup relationship. You can create a master detail relationship. And there is another option of, of a hierarchical relationship. Now what is this hierarchical relationship? Hierarchical relationship is only available in the case of users. Let me give you a brief into that one. So let's say if you go to a user object here, so if you go for a user object um, and uh, if you go ahead and click on one of the, let me go ahead and create objects, let's say, go to B. Okay, so uh, not on the users, but under the build customize users. Okay, so if you go under here, there is a field. So go to that one. And now let's say you wanted to add a new field. Here you will see a third type of relationship called as a hierarchical. There's a relationship called as hierarchical relationship. So now what this hierarchical relationship, this is only is available in the case of the user object, allows the user to click a lookup icon and select another user from a pop-up list. So basically, it's just like a lookup relationship. You can you will see a like a search box, you can click on it and it'll open a list of users. But this is only available in the case of a um, in the case of users. So if you go to any other object, let's say if I go to account object and wanted to create field for the account object, then you do not see the hierarchy relationship here. There's only two different available lookup relationship you have and you also do not have a master detail relationship because they have already used that relationship in the case of the account object. So this is what we have as a lookup relationship we have, then we have as a master detail relationship, and then we have an external lookup relationship when you are trying to connect with an external object in a different, whole different application outside of your Salesforce. So these are the lookup relationship and the master detail relationship. So no matter whatever kind of relationship you are creating, the, the, the relationship field will always go on the child object. Now, how many relationship fields you can create? So you can own, you can create up to 25 lookup relationship fields okay the number is you can create up to 25 lookup relationship fields and you can create up to two master detail relationship field on an object okay now what is the difference between a lookup relationship and a master field master field master detail relationship sorry this is not a master field this is a master detail relationship so you can create 25 maximum number and then they have a two for the master detail relationship now the lookup relationship is basically when you have a parent object and then you have a child object if you want to delete the parent when you delete the parent child object will not get deleted okay child object will not get deleted and uh, that becomes a lookup relationship by default if you delete a parent the child will not get deleted it's a loosely coupled relationship. So lookup is a loosely coupled relationship. But you can still, in the case of lookup relationship, you can still set up that, okay, you can still set up a call, something called a cascade delete, where which, which means that whenever you delete a parent, the child will always get deleted. But there's another setting that you need to delete, that you need to do, but that's called a cascade delete. And that setting, you it is not on by default. You need to call Salesforce support to enable that setting for you. 
they don't recommend you but there is the setting available called as cascade delete in that case you can establish a relationship where you can say if I delete the parent object the child object will also get deleted but that is all that is called as a cascade delete okay and to enable that kind of functionality you need to go to Salesforce to they will enable it for you whereas in the case of master detail relationship is a tightly coupled relationship wherever whenever you delete a parent record a child record will get deleted as well okay so what do I mean by that for example in this case let's say so let's say uh, look give me an example guys I want you to give me an example what will be the example of a loosely coupled relationship uh, what, <clears throat> excuse me one would be um a user you'd have to have a user I guess for hierarchical okay but what will so with whom you're trying to create the relationship like what is an example in a real life what can be an example of a of a loosely coupled relationship uh, I was going to say a customer and um, business owner customer and a business owner yes Okay, so you're saying if the business get deleted, whereas the customer becomes the child object? Correct. And the business is the business owner is the parent object, and when you delete the person, the business, then there is no longer the existence of the customer. Very good. Okay. Well, what about others? What other example you can think of a loosely coupled relationship or a tight couple, like a master detail or a lookup in a real time scenario? Uh, for example, in a recruiting app, uh, we, we would have the positions and candidate. Okay, so um, come out of the recruiting app, now think about something else. Okay. Um, hold on. Anybody else? A student teacher relationship. That's the a loosely coupled, teacher. right? Or a, or That's loosely coupled. The teacher uh, is the master and student is the child, but uh, just because the teacher is deleted, the students won't get automatically deleted. Exactly. So there's a loosely coupled relationship here. Okay. So these are the different different examples. So where will be the relationship field go? Relationship field will always go on the child object, no matter either you're creating a lookup relationship or either you're creating a master detail relationship. Okay. Now in the case of the master detail relationship, when you delete the parent object, the child object will also get deleted. Very good example of that is let's say an employee and his PTOs. Okay, that's a very, very good example of an employee and a PTO. PTO is basically the paid time off that he takes, all the, um, all the time off that he has taken in the entire year of his work. So in, when an employee leaves the, com leaves the company, then there's no point of keeping his PTOs, right? There's no, ref there's no, no importance of how many vacations it took last year because he already left the, com uh, left the company. So that is what the a tightly coupled relationship will be. So there will be an employee and a PTO where the employee is the parent object and where is the, the PTO is the child and the relationship type we can create is a master detail. So whenever you delete a parent object, the child objects will also get deleted. So now what we're going to do is we are going to go ahead and create a relationship between the invoice object and the line item object. Now one invoice object can have multiple line items. So what kind of relationship I'm going to create here? I'm going to create a master detail relationship. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and create a master detail relationship. And one line object can have multiple, like merchandise. Sorry, one merchandise. And then we have a line item. So, uh, so we're going to create a relationship between merchandise and a line item and we're going to create a relationship between invoice and line item. So first of all, I need to create that object called as line item. So how will I do? I'll go back here, I'll go to the setup and I will go ahead and create a new object and we'll call it as a custom object. So what is the name of the object? Let's say this is the line item object. Plural label is line items. And uh, this is going to consider as a line item number. 
and we'll leave it as text. The reason, because it's easy to handle text as compared to auto number, so I'll call it as line item number, but I will use it as a text notation here. And then we're going to go ahead and allow all those features, the optional features. And then hit the save button. We might just go ahead and not give the tab for this object. Let's say we do that. So let's go back. Okay, so we have created a line item object. So here's other different different fields. We have not created a tab for this particular object. Now what we're going to do is we're going to add some fields for this particular object. Okay, so the first field we're going to add is a quantity field. Now what will be the data type? The data type is going to be equals to number. Okay, so the data type will be a number because how many pieces of laptops, how many headsets he bought, whatever. So that is going to be the uh, line item, the, the field that we're going to add is a quantity field here. Visible to all the profiles. Hit next and then hit the save button. So now what we have done is we have created a line item object. Now what we're going to do is we're going to establish a relationship between the line item and the invoice object. So right now if you go to the uh, if you go to the schema builder and if you pull up both these objects, one is the let me go ahead and pull up the merchandise object, and if we pull up the invoice object. There is right now there is no relationship we have built between these two objects. Okay, so now we are going to add another object here. Let's say we bring up the line item as well, and the line item object is looks like this. So all these are standalone entities and they have no relationship between each other. So what we are going to do is we are going to go ahead and create a master detail relationship. So where will be the field will go? Should I go to the line item object or should I go to the invoice object in order to create the master detail relationship? Line item. What about others? Yes, line uh, item, uh, child object. Okay, so we're going to go to the line item object here. And how many maximum number of master detail relationship you can create on a object? Twenty-five. Two. Two. Master two, 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 two. 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 Yeah, lookup relationship is twenty-five. Okay. okay. So um, now let's say if you have created a let's another example. Can you create, uh, is it a possible to create a relationship between a standard object and a custom object? Can you create a lookup relationship between a standard object and a custom object? Yes. Okay. Yes. Let me clear this. Okay. So, standard object and the custom object so can you uh, can you create a relationship where a parent is a standard object and a child is a custom object and can you create a master detail relationship between these two can you yes. Okay, one, okay, okay, can you write, write the answers in the uh, message. Just yes or no. Okay. Okay, and how about a relationship where a child is a parent, ch ch sorry, child is a standard object and the parent is a and the custom is a parent object and can you create a master detail relationship between them? Yes or no? Can you repeat the question Deepika? So the question is if the standard object is a child object and if the custom object is a parent object can you create a master detail relationship between these two?
No. Okay, you cannot do that. Because what happens is according to, very good, because what happens is whenever you delete a parent, according to master digital relationship, the child objects will get deleted. So we do not want this. Now, can you create a lookup relationship between them? Yes, okay. As long as you're not setting up the cascade delete, okay? Similarly, you can create a create a lookup relationship when this is a child and this is a uh, parent object, okay? So you can you you make sure you do not do the cascade delete, so you will be still be able to set up a lookup relationship between these two. Okay. So now we're going to go back here and we're going to go ahead and create our relationship. So I'm on the line item object. I'm on the line item object here. And then I'm going to go ahead and create a new relationship. And which kind of relationship I'm going to create? I'm going to create a master detail relationship. Now, always go through this. It creates a special type of parent-child relationship between this object, the child or the detail. Okay, so the, the, the object that we are in right now is considered as a child object and another object, which is also considered as a master, where the relationship field is required on all the detail records. So what does that mean is, if you are so now this this particular line item this particular field will become a required field on the line item object which means if you are trying to create a line item record then you have to provide the invoice value of in that line item record because in the case of master detail relationship the relationship field is a required field but in the case of the lookup relationship when you are creating this particular field is not a required, it's an optional field. You either can have a value, you either cannot have a value. But if you're creating a master detail relationship, then the relationship field is required. The ownership and sharing of a detail record are determined by the master record. So who will be the owner of the detail record will be controlled by the master record. So who, whatever owner is for the master record, that will decide the ownership and the sharing of the detail record. Detail record is the child record. When a user deletes the master record, all the detail records are deleted. You can create the role of summary fields on the master record to summarize the detail records. So let's say if I want you to go ahead and uh, you can create the role of summary fields on the master record. So role of summary fields can only be created on the master record. Okay, so here in this case, um, we, are, we are going to create a roll-up summary field on the invoice object and roll-up summary is basically if you wanted to summarize the data from the detail record. Let's say I wanted to calculate now how many items are available in this particular invoice. So that is a roll-up summary field. Means you're going to roll up the number of line items associated with the invoice. Okay, we will talk about roll-up summary in the next um, section. So this is what the relationship field allow the user to click on a lookup icon. So they are going to give you an icon to select a value from a pop-up list. The master object is the source of the value. So what will pop up? The pop-up will all the master values will pop up. So this is what a master detail relationship is. Now let's go ahead and hit the next button. Now, what is going to be the related to object? So we are going to go ahead and relate this to the invoice object. Hit the next button. Feed name. Invoice. Child relationship name is going to leave it as it is, is a line items. So allow reparenting is another checkbox they've added. If you want the child records can be reparent to the other parent records after they are created. So if you wanted to reparent them to a different parent, then you can do that if this particular checkbox is checked. Now here the visible, we are going all these profiles, we're making it the field level security for the profile. So is this field visible to all the profiles? Yes. Hit the next button. So now we have created a relationship. So we call it that the related list label will remain as it is, line items and hit the save button. So all the related list label will appear below. Okay, so now if you go to the invoices, if you click on an invoice, you will see there is a line items available. Okay, if you go ahead and click here, there's a line items available. 
And if you click on this new line items, this there's a line item number and then there is a invoice number available. So this becomes a required field because there is a, you can see here there's a red sign. If you do not enter the value for this and if you only give a, if you only provide the value for the line item number, you will not be able to save because the relationship field, because since we created a master detail, it becomes a required field in this case. Okay. So now what we have done is we have created a relationship here between a line item object and an invoice object. And what kind of relationship it is? It's a one-to-many relationship. And whereas the line item becomes the child object. Now if you go back to the schema builder and you pull up the same records, the pull up the same objects that we created, you see there is a relationship we have created between invoice and the line item. And if you hover your mouse, you will see what kind of relationship it is. It's a master detail relationship. Now similarly, what we are going to do is we are going to create a lookup relationship between a line item and a merchandise. Whereas in this case, the merchandise becomes the parent object and a line item becomes the child object. Okay, so we are going to create a second kind of relationship between the line item and the merchandise. So where I'm going to go next, I'm, also, I'm going to go to the line items here. Again, I'm going to pull up the line item object and I'm going to create a new relationship. And how do you create it? So you select the lookup relationship here. So this creates a relationship that links this object to another object. It's a loosely coupled. It is just to establish the relationship between the cause of one object to the other. The relationship field allow the user to click on a lookup icon. So they, they will open a like a search box where you can select the value from a pop-up list and the other source is the source of the values. It means the map, whatever the Whatever the whatever so let's say if you're creating a uh, lookup relationship field on the line item so what will happen is there will be a pop-up will be appearing next to the lookup relationship field and when you click on that you will be able to see all the merchandise related information hit the next button related to which object it is related to the merchandise object so I'm going to find the merchandise hit the next button. Hit the next. Visible to all. Hit next. Data type is lookup. Field name is merchandise. Page layout name is line item layout. Hit the next button. Related list label. So the label on the related list will be called as line items. Okay. Hit the name save button. So if you now, if you go to the merchandise, if you click on one of these, you will see there is a line items got added. Okay, there is a line item got added. And if you click on this one, this particular field, you can see here the merchandise lookup field is not a required one. Okay, it's not a required one. So you either can provide the value or either you, or if it depends on you if you want to provide the value or if you do not. And once you click on this lookup box, it's going to pop up all the merchandise's names that we have created. Okay, so this is what the difference between a lookup relationship and a master detail relationship. Any questions so far? Yes. What's the um the one about the delete uh, um guess delete? Well, come again, come again, Nick. What is it? Yes. There's there's one in there. You mentioned something about uh, guess and delete. Uh, delete the child or delete. The okay. 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 So okay. Okay. Let me let me show oh. you what do I mean by that. So now what we have done is. Since we created a master detail relationship between the invoice object and the line item. So let's say I created a merchandise, call it as the merchandise name is let's say laptop. Okay. And uh, now let's the price of the laptop is let's say $400. I, I have a quantity of one and the type is let's say electron. And I hit the save button. Now, this particular merchandise I created, now let me create an invoice as well. So let's say we created an invoice and the status of an own voice is open. Amount is $500. Hit the save button. And what are the line items associated with it? Let's say the line item number is 1, invoice is 003. Merchandise I bought is laptop. Okay. So what I've done is I've entered just records. Now, if I delete this invoice, if I delete this particular invoice, you what you will see is if I delete this invoice, the line item will also get deleted. So if invoice 03 has a line items called 1, 
Okay, there's an inline item called one here. And when you open that line item, you will see that these are the, you will see what, uh, you will see all the line item information. Okay, let me, let me go ahead and create a tab so that you will understand what I mean. So I will create a tab for the line item as well. So to make sure, so just to make sure, to make it clear. So we're going to create a separate tab for line item just to illustrate what do I mean by deleting the parent object will delete the child object. So hit the next button. Next, let me include this particular tab in the warehouse application. We, we went through this yesterday. So now what I have done is I have there's a separate tab available for line items. And right now this line item has a line item number. We have one record under this and that is basically linked to laptop and this is the invoice. Now if I went ahead and delete this invoice number 03, which is associated with this line item, Okay, this line item is associated with this invoice. If I went ahead and delete this, what will happen is it will automatically delete the line items. So if I go to the line items, if I click on go, I do not see that line item anymore. That is what I meant by if you delete the parent record, the child records will get deleted in case of master detail relationship. Is that clear, Nick? Uh, I think we have that uh, he's talking about the cascade uh, cascade deletion in lookup. Like how, where would we set that up? So in the cascade delete, that is you. This particular option is right not not available if you go to the lookup because I said the lookup the in the case of the lookup relationship, the cascade option you need to call to the Salesforce custom support to enable that option for you. But there's something called as oh, cascade delete. So, yeah. Oh, we, we don't even see the option on the, uh, so it's done like back end, like you can't see it here, right? Let's see if I go back and I create a lookup relationship. Yeah, because when I was creating, I didn't see that option. So we go to the... Yeah, that's, that's, I have, we yeah. haven't seen that ever. Yeah, we haven't seen that option, right? Because if I go back here and I try to create a lookup relationship with the next button, Related to, let's see, I'm just pulling up and just want to see if this option is available. So allows required a field in the in order to save the record if you want to make it. What do you what to do if the lookup record is deleted? Clear the value of this field. You can't choose this option if you make this field required. Don't allow the deletion of the lookup record that's a part of the lookup relationship. If you do not want this, you can click on this one. Yeah, you can prevent, but uh, not the other way around. But not the other way around. Yeah, because they, they said that when I read the book, they said that the cascade deletion is available. It's an option, but that has to be called to the customer care, to the Salesforce to enable that option for your organization. I'm sure it will be a certification question. But they, they ask you a question on casket delete for sure. They do they do have it, but they do not. So they, they, there is an option of casket delete, but I don't think so. I, I can see set it up, but they will definitely have a question on casket delete. Like what is casket delete? Something related to that. We, when we we'll go through the question section, we'll, we can take a look at it. If there is a question related to that. So, so we have created a relationship between the merchandise and the line items, invoices and the line items. Now let's go ahead and uh, talk about, let me see if there's any more points. Deepika? Yes, yes ma'am. Uh, actually like if, at all, if we are storing a master ID in the child object, then we can make anything like, uh, you know, if we are storing it, then it becomes a master, master detail relationship. There is no restriction on which object need to be master detail or which object should not be, right? As long as, like, you know, if I think uh, I want to make a line item as parent, I can make it. Yeah, you can make it, but then, yeah, you can do that. There's no restriction, but there should be some, like, relationship, right? You, yeah, you, through Salesforce, you can create whatever. It's not going to prevent you from not creating the relationship, but there should be, like, when you're, there should be business logic behind that, like, okay, how we are going to relate the merchandise and invoices, those kind of business. Yeah, you can create whatever the relationship you want based on whatever objects. So there's no restriction, but there should be some logic going behind that, okay, the significance is this. Like one invoice okay. can have multiple line items, but I can definitely go to the line item. 
I can definitely go to the invoice and create a massive detail relationship with the, with the line item. It's not going to prevent me from doing that. Okay, so we are storing a master ID in the shell. That means it becomes a master detail. For the lookup, what are we storing? Like, you know, where we are storing the ID? How will I know that which one is like, you know, which, where, where do we store that ID? See here, if you go to the merchandise, if you go to the line item, you see there is a merchandise thing got added. This one. This is a lookup relationship. Okay. So this is for the lookup relationship. So the only difference when you, only difference is the invoice becomes a required field because it's a master detail relationship. Merchandise is not a required field because it's a lookup relationship. Is and that we get an icon where we can choose whatever yeah. we want. Yeah, and right? you get an icon and this is a lookup box and here you can pick up whichever you want. Okay. Which particular okay. merchandise yeah. name if, you want if to at all, If at all I want to query, like, you know, which, which lookups, like, you know, what is the pairing? Uh, in back end what will be the relationship like you know because for master detail I know that I have to search on a child master ID but here for the lookup how will I know that both are connected together okay 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 tell me I still uh, for you know uh, because we because we use like um, you know C SQL query for Salesforce that is so cool like if at all we get something like okay go ahead and search for uh, what all uh, what all the line items are associated with this merchandise like okay, with okay so if you want to do that okay so here if you go to the line items if you go to the view fields there is a field automatically got added called merchandise. So if you wanted to select for this particular line item, what are the invoices and merchandise, you can do that saying select invoice underscore underscore C comma merchandise underscore underscore C from line item object, you can pull up. So it will pull up the invoice related to that line item. It will also pull up the merchandise related to the line item. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, this, is that what your question was? Yes, yes. Okay. Thank yeah. you, sir. You can see here the API names are available. So you can I mean, okay. you can pull up both the things. But the only thing is you you don't have to provide the value for the lookup field, whereas you have to provide the value for the master field. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So there's a note about the delete this record option. So when you go create a lookup relationship, there was, I said there was a cascade delete. So what happens is the delete this on record option is works similar to the master detail relationship. And what will it do is it will delete the record whenever the lookup record is deleted. But where such a deletion in a lookup relationship is called as a cascade deletion and it will bypass the security and the sharing setting. That is also another point. So whatever there is, it will bypass the, the, the sharing and the security setting. So for example, users will be able to delete the records when the lookup record is deleted, even if they do not have the access to the related records. Are you, are you getting that point? So if the cascade delete option is enabled, let's say, and if you delete a lookup record, then what will happen is the, the child records will also get deleted even if the user does not have the permission to access the relatedness. Okay, so this, the, this particular relationship makes more sense when the object that we are trying to create the relationship are coupled together tightly. That is the only case we will enable this option. Because we cannot create more than two master data relationship. And if you need a third kind of relationship, and that's a coupled relationship, then in that case, you will choose this option. Okay? Okay, so then the next thing we are going to do is, Okay, Nick has forwarded me an article. Let me see what he has forwarded. Okay. 
Yeah, a cascade delete bypasses the security in the sharing setting, which means the user can delete the records when the target lookup record is deleted, even if they do not have the access to the records. To prevent the records from being accidentally deleted, cascade delete is disabled by default. You need to contact the salesforce.com to get enable this option on your custom lookup relationship by your organization. Thank you, Nick. Okay. So now let's go back and create another thing here. We'll talk about next point. So we have created two relationships. And now another thing we wanted to do is, let's say, uh, okay. Now tell me, guys, I want you to, since, see, see this is an application um, I randomly picked up and I do not have much detail. So we are going to just use our brains to kind of make, make this application a little uh, little big. So let's say if you, I wanted to create a uh, validation rule, how will I do it? Let's, if I want, what do you mean by that is let's say if I wanted to make sure that every time the status of the invoice is closed, then what I need to make sure is if the status is closed, I wanted to make sure that, uh, let's, let's first add if another field here to this invoice object. Let's say we added date date field we'll add, which is called a closed and open date for the invoice. Okay, Open date and the closed date for the invoice. So how I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the new. What will be the data type guys? If I wanted to add a field called open date. Date. Okay. That's very common date. And let's hit the name next button. And the name of the field is open date. And the field name is open date. Hit the next button visible to all, hit the next and save. And then I'm going to add another field here, which is also called as close date. So we're going to go ahead and pick that is also will be of type date, hit the next button, close date, and then hit the visible and hit the next button and hit the save. Okay, so now we have, if you go to the invoices, you see there is, there is these two fields got added. One is the open date and then another one is the close date. So let's say I wanted to make sure that, uh, first of all, the first rule that I wanted to make sure is the, whenever you provide the open date, sorry, whenever you change the status of the invoice to closed, the closed date should be provided. Otherwise, it's, it should throw me an error. It means I should not be allowing the user, I should not allow the user to save a record when the status of the invoice is closed and the close date is empty. How we are going to make sure doing that? How we will do it? Did you understand the requirement? The requirement is if the status of the invoice is changed to close, close date should not be blank. And we wanted to make sure we throw an error. We can do it using validation rule. Okay. We can use to the validation rule. So how we will do it? So we'll go up here and we can create here a new validation rule. This is a place you can go ahead and create a new validation rule. And what will be the rule name? Let's say close date rule. Now important point here is define a validation rule by specifying the error condition and a corresponding error message. So we do not have to specify the good condition. We have to specify here the error condition. So in which scenario you should throw the error. The error should be thrown if the close date is equals to if the if the status is equals to closed and the close date is blank. In that case, I'm going to throw the error. So the message that you have to provide here should be the error condition. The condition is going to be an error condition and we will have a corresponding error message. The error condition is should be a Boolean expression means it should only return either a true or a false. You cannot have return the number, you cannot return a number from it or anything. It either has to be a true or a false. When the formula expressions return true, the save will be aborted. Means you won't be able to do saving of that record and the error message will be displayed. And the user can correct the error and try to save the record. So if, because why we wanted to do it? We wanted to make sure all the errors are captured on the front end before it makes a call to the server. Okay. Before even it goes back, because we wanted to have all that information that we will need. So we are, we are putting some validation rules so that 
make making sure that whenever you save a record all these grid criteria is met before you save the record so what is the error condition the error condition is the status is equals to what the status is equals to uh, to close and if the close date is blank so this is going to be my error condition hey dipika i have a question uh, can I, is there um, a way we can just when you uh, choose the status as closed uh, the closed date should be po populated you know automatically when you go to when you hit save the closed date should be like system date like today's date we can um, you know write a rule uh, that way also so we don't have to show a error and then somebody enters a closed date and then hit the save button so you are saying that whenever a whenever the status is equals to closed yeah when you automatically, you, uh, automatically you pull up the default uh, default date today's date as a closed date yes system date yes is that or date, yeah just yeah you can go ahead do what you do yeah that that you can do it that you can do it but you can do it through like a workflow wherever you workflow yeah. look, that's what i was i wanted to make sure it's like we can do it uh, in validation or workflow yeah you can do something like that okay since we're learning about validation i wanted to give an example of this one okay okay so you can see that okay update this field when the status changes uh, so next thing is now how we're going to do is so these are the insert fields so whatever fields you wanted to check the status for so let's say i wanted to check the status insert so it is going to go ahead and check the status of the field so if the function i'm going to pull up is let me first go like this these are all the functions available logical test so what i'm testing here i'm testing the status field values Hey guys, what will be the answer? Tell me. What should I do here? You need to select the field for uh, you know if uh, after field. if in okay. parenthesis yeah. if then the field. Okay, where should I? Yeah, in front. Is the field status okay then um then you you give a uh, value on uh, if it's status is, is um stop i mean uh, closed closed in quote in in, quote. At, at, at the place of value if true close you have to write close in the in, in, uh, in, in uh, quote and quote close see here we are you are doing like another thing if status is equals to close close okay then um no this doesn't look good to me no see the condition it was if logical test what you are checking you are checking the status of the so first thing is there is a field called is pick val. So we're going to go ahead and there is a function okay. available. Well, yes. Oh, is pick val. Right. 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 There's a function available called is pick val. And then the, what is the field name we wanted to check? We wanted to check the field name is the a status. Very good. Status. What should be the value here? Closed. 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 So if the pick val is equals to closed, so if this is the condition, if the is closed and what is the next condition it should be? The open and the close date is blank, right? So there's a function yes. available called is blank. Is blank. And what is what are we checking? We are checking the is blank for the close date. So that close is also, date. 
part of the invoice object that we created. So this is if the close date is blank and the is pequal status is equals to close, in that case, you should throw me an error. This is what my error condition is. So every time if the pick quest, let me make sure the close is like it's the right close. You go to the status. It should match exactly the the type. Yeah. Match the exact uh, case sensitive and everything. Is, I think so. So closed and is blank is closed. It in this case, the error message would be please provide the close date value. And you can put the error location either it's on the top or on the next to the field, whatever you want to do it. I'm going to go ahead and hit the save button. Let me see if it's okay. Let's see if it prevents us. So if you go ahead and create an invoice, you provide the status as closed, and you provide the amount as 45, hit the save button, it's going to give you the error here. And what is the uh, close date? If you once you provide the close date, it's going to go ahead and make sure the, um, it's going to go ahead and make sure the, uh, that information is selected, okay? So this is validating the data before you save. So let's say, how will I create another validation rule? I want to make sure that open date should always be less than the close date. What does that mean is, if you have opened an invoice today, the close date will be after today. So you should never put a close date before the open date. How will I do that? Another, that will be another validation rule. Okay, and what, how will I create the validation rule? So if I go ahead and create a new validation rule, and uh, what should be, so what will be the formula here? Tell me guys, tell me fast, fast, fast. <laughs> okay, if uh, hmm? you would have, if open date. So I'm going to pick an insert from here. If the open date, okay, very good. And then, what kind of operators? You have these multiple operators you have. Less than. Less than, greater than. Okay, if the open date is less than. Less than. Less than. Okay. Are you sure? Are you sure is this should be less than? Greater, greater than. Right, because you have to give error condition. The error oh, condition greater than, right. Yeah. yeah, error condition should be that, okay, whenever the open date is greater than the close date, in that case, I'm going to throw an error. Syntax looks good. Then we can say close date, open date, error. And uh, the error message would be close date should be after the open date. And this time I wanted to put the error message on top of the next to the field. And which field? Let's say I wanted to put the message next to the close date field. Hit the same uh, button. I, I, okay. I have a question. I don't mean to complicate things, but is it possible to have a close date equal to the open date if, if somebody, if there's okay. a change in mind? That's a worst case scenario, I know. Okay, so what is it? What do you want me to do? I know. I was just curious as to whether or not there might be instances where you have open date, um, same date as the closed date, and would you, would you have to use... Uh, date and time in that instance as your data type. You can do if you can you can do without the date and time. You can just say okay as the same yeah. If you wanted to make sure like it is the if you use date you can say it can be equals to date. Okay. And you can do that instead of using date and time to get it too deep and complex. You can just make it as a date where you say if the date time is equals to close date. That is also fine. Okay. Okay, here you can say, instead of saying greater than, you can even say greater than equals to. That's that's what I was going to say. I was going to, okay, great, awesome. Okay, so <coughs> with that, with I that. Think that if you are, um, I'm sorry, if, if uh, you are closing, putting it a close date more than, then it already covers everything before today's date. So if you are doing like uh, entering both that date as, as same, it should not matter. You can test it also. You don't need to give that equal to. If okay. if you give that equal to, it will not allow to close that is uh, done today. Oh, okay, 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 okay. I know, I know what she's saying. Yeah, the same day yeah. you can't close it then if you have to.
So if you do, okay, let's put it, if the open date is greater than close date, in that case, it's going to throw an error, okay? So now if I hit the save button, and if you go back to the invoices, and uh, let's go ahead and create a, let's say the open status, amount is, let's say, 900, open date is, let's say, 7, and close date is equals to 9. Is this should be allowed or not? This should be allowed, right? Because close date is after the open date. Okay, so it is going to go ahead and click. Okay, now let's create another invoice here. And in this case, we provide an open date of 7. Close date is equals to 7. Does the condition meet here? I would say no, because it's got to be greater. Greater is, no, so see, see, Nick, the greater is the time it is going to throw an error. So are we going to get an error here or no? No. No, right? We are not going to get an error. Nick, are you getting it? See, the condition, so, yes. yeah, so, so the condition is, if the open rate, if the close date is before the open date, then only throw the error. So that is our condition. So right now, the open date, the close date is not before the open date. It is equal to. So in this case, the error will not be thrown. So it will go ahead and allow us to create. But now if you go back and if you create another invoice where you give a close date before the open date, in this case, it should complain. An error would be yeah. at the place here. Close date should be after the open date. Thank you for pointing that issue. I'm glad we, we picked it up. So in this case, it is going to avoid it. Any questions so far? No, Deepika. Okay. So we have to, what is the difference between validation for record item and validation for record sets? Okay, so we're going to go ahead. Okay, can you illustrate what you're asking here, Nick? Right, when you go to create, when you go to create um, a validation rule, like if I go into search and then uh, look up validation rule, there's the validation rule under uh, record items and another one under record sets. Okay, let's, let's just look for validation rule. Sure. That's all. I, I saw two different entries there. One looks like it's a child of the other. Duplicate record set validation rule. So in this example that we just created, uh, was the validation rule created under the um, Record item or under the record set? I think both are kind of same. Okay. Yeah. See here, like, it's the same thing, the validation rules. I created here, so it's the same record I set. Okay, this is the record set. Let's go to the validation rule under the record items. Yeah, it's the same. It's doing the same thing. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's doing the same thing. It's doing the same thing. Uh, you can, it's basically for checking for record. If you wanted to check for duplication, if you wanted to check for a value of a particular field is not empty, all the same things it's doing. It's basically on a record set and one is on a record individual item. But it's doing the same thing. So now the next thing we have is, let's say if I want, there's another thing we have is called as the, uh, so we did formula fields. Did we do formula fields? No, we did the validation rule so far. Now, the next thing is, um, let's say we wanted to go ahead and create a dependent and a controlling pick list. Do you know what it is? Dependent and a controlling pick list. Anybody? Yes, this, mean, this means one, one, if you select something, like if you are selecting a country, then uh, from a pick list uh, uh, of a few countries, then the controlling will be the state and uh, uh, dependent will be the state when you pick us then the state pick list should only pull uh, the states related to usa or like there is a child and uh, it means a teacher and uh, and a student then uh, if you select a teacher then all the students or all the courses that that teacher is taking will be okay collected. okay okay so let me ask you a question can a checkbox field can be a controlling field 
Yes, uh, yes, because if, if there is something, if you want to check on, then it, uh, the pick list will only select the value uh, related to the, the check. Like if you are checking something, uh, like if... Uh, uh, okay, I got it. Yeah, it can okay, be okay. done, but I... Okay. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I Give an example. Huh? You want an example for dependent and current? No, I just, I just, that, that's fine, that's fine. So what we're okay. going to do is we're going to go ahead and uh, there are some a lot of questions can come from this. First of all, question that comes is it, what's a controlling and a dependent pickers? So as she explained, it was a very good example. So if one particular field value is dependent on the other field value, so let's say you have a field here and you have a field here. So the values that you uh, display in the second field if it's dependent on what we have selected in it in the first field that's basically like it this call it dependent pick list okay so this particular is called as a dependent pick list because it is dependent on this particular value which we select from the first field so this becomes a controlling field and this, this becomes a dependent field so for example in our case let's say we create a uh, on the uh, let's say on the merchandise object okay on the merchandise object let's say we add a field called uh, type okay and let's say there are options of are we selecting a product from audio sets are we selecting a product from videos are you selecting some phone accessories so let's say these are the three different type of products that we have in our store and if the user selects audio then he will be seeing three options one is let's say speakers then we have uh, Bluetooth speakers and then let's say we have another thing called as uh, uh, home theater speakers. Okay, let's say we have this one. In the video options, we have uh, LCDs, then we have TV, then we have, let's say, uh, projector and screens. Okay, so these are the three options. In the case of phone accessories, let's say the user should see charge, uh, the phone cable, the, the charge cable, then you have a, uh, head, uh, headphones, Okay, what else? Uh, then you can see uh, headphones, earphones, phone, phone charger, headphones. Okay, what is under phone accessories? Okay, screen protector. So let's say these, this is what we wanted to create. This is a requirement where we have a type as a field and the option for those fields is either audio, video or phone. And depending upon what the user has picked up, then there will be a field called product type. Okay product type and if the user has selected audio he should see all these three options if the user has selected video and he should see all these three options and if the user has selected phone he should see all these three options that is what we are going to do here so let's go back and to the merchandise and we are going to add a new field here and let's say the field that okay there's already a field called type matter electronics let me go ahead and delete it i was just playing around with it so that's why let me go to the objects Go to the merchandise object. We have a field called the image deleted. So let's go ahead and create a new field, and uh, we are going to go ahead and this is going to be a pick list. Okay. This is going to be a pick list and let's say the name of the field is let's say type merchandise type. So we're going to add the values with each value separated by a new line. So we're going to add to uh, let's say audio, video, phone accessories. Okay, this is what we have. And then Hit the next button, visible to all, hit the next, and save and name. So we have created a field called merchandise type. Now we're going to add another field, which is also going to be a pick list. So let's say we're going to go ahead and select another one right next. So let's say, uh, call this call. What should, what, you, what should I name this field to make sense? So we have merchandise type. Subtype, let's say. Okay. Subtype, enter the values. 
let's say here we have speakers, Bluetooth speakers. These are the options, okay? Bluetooth speakers. Then we have the like items, right? Oh, come these, on. Are, these are the actual mission. These are the actual items. Uh, we can say like, like in the. the uh, kind of. Yeah, you can say yeah. Yeah. So these are the actual items because somebody is going to buy a type of speakers. We have Bluetooth speakers. You can. I just wanted to make sure what the difference is. That is Bluetooth speakers, and then let's say these are the kind of like item types. Like what what types of items we have? They might have different different brands, but this is like the subcategory of. Bluetooth speakers, and we have different Bluetooth speakers by JBL, AKG, yeah, right. Harman. Okay, we can cons those considered can be like a specific product, but this we can consider like a subtype. See, at, at this application is nowhere existing, so I'm just making it on a fly to make things understandable. Because if I just cover hey, what is controlling field, what is this, you won't be able to get it. So I wanted to make in a project based so that you understand. So we have speakers. Yeah, and and like right. You're right. Yeah, you're right about that because uh, uh, the item this would not be the item actually. The the uh, the specific product for under the speaker that would be the item. Yeah, like so what, what brand or category? Yeah, this is like a subcategory. Okay, so uh, then we have Bluetooth speakers and let's say we have I don't know if both are different or not. Let's go ahead and have wireless speakers as well. Then you have is a TV. Let's say projector and screen and uh, phone accessories. Let's say we have a phone charger. Uh, then we have uh, oh oh. Phone charger, then let's say we have a Bluetooth headphones. This is also part of phone accessories. Then we have is a screen protector, phone cover, or we can say cases, phone case. So these are different, different kinds of uh, items available okay so now we have created a two pick list here let's go ahead and hit the next button and then let's visible to all hit the next button and then hit the save so what i've done is if you go to the merchandise if you click on the new item here so there's a field called merchandise type so if you select audio right now this merchandise subtype has everything in it okay now let's say i wanted to make sure that when i click on audio i only want the speakers, Bluetooth speakers, and wireless speakers should be available. If the user clicks on video, he should only see TV, projector, and screen. If the user clicks on um, phone accessories, then in that case, he should pick Bluetooth headphones, uh, screen protector, phone cases, and phone charger. Okay, so this is what we wanted to do. So this we can do through the creation of one will be considered as a controlling field, the other one becomes independent field. So in this case, the controlling field would be what? Merchandise type. Because based on what the user is picking up here, we wanted to display different options in this field. So this particular field becomes the dependent field, and this particular field becomes the controlling field. So how we will do that? We are going to go ahead, and we'll go to the view field section. And if you scroll down, we will see there is something called as a field dependencies. So we are going to go ahead and go to the field dependency section here and we are going to create a new field dependency here so let's go through this create a dependent relationship that calls the values in the pick list or a multi select pick list to be dynamically filtered based on the value selected by user in the another field now tell me guys can the controlling field can be a multi select pick list or not controlling field can be a multi select pick list or not tell me Yes, uh, or no. No. yes or no? What about others? No. Okay. Because, see, you cannot have multiple uh, controlling, multiple multi-select pick list because, you, don't, because you, you can only are allowed to choose one thing. What about a checkbox? It can a checkbox field can be a merchandise type, like can be a controlling field or not? Yes. Okay. Checkbox fields can be controlling fields. Multi-select pick list cannot be controlling fields. And how many, what is the, if you guys remember, what is the maximum numbers of values that are allowed in a controlling field? Does anybody know of that number? No. Very good, Kiran. That is 300. Thank you. Okay. 300 is the number. Now, next thing is, 
can a multi select pick list can uh, the pick can, the yes. 300 is combined together uh, both controlling and also dependent right or no. only one only controlling field only controlling okay yeah. both combined together we have a limit i think that i'm not sure then we okay. have to check okay but the maximum of 300 values allowed in the controlling field okay now next question i have is a multi select pick list can it be a dependent pick list yes or no multi select pick list see these are the questions i'm picking up from admin exam okay so you need to be very yes, careful with this no yeah can be yes yes okay somebody is saying no kiran is saying no see for a dependent fields multi select pick list can be dependent pick list okay and can check box can be dependent fields or no no very good check box cannot be dependent fields nick are you following okay good so let me write down for everybody uh, so these are the points here okay check box fields can be controlling fields okay now the next thing is multi select pick list cannot be controlling fields yes okay and uh, there is a maximum of 300 values allowed in a controlling field and somebody just gave me a number for together also let me see what is that number if a field is both a controlling field and it can't contain more than 300 a controlling field can have up to 300 values if a field is both a controlling field and a dependent pick list it can't contain more than 300 values okay somebody has pointed that limitation now the next thing we have is in the case of dependent field multi select pick list can be dependent pick list okay can be dependent yes. Yes. and the next thing is check boxes cannot be dependent dependent okay so now another question i have is can you select the default values for controlling fields or no No. My question no, is I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, my question is let me put the question. Can you set the default values? Can you set the default values for Are you guys enjoying yes. the class or no? Yeah, I think we can set. Yeah. And what about the dependent? No. Very good. so you can set the default values for controlling fields but you cannot set it for the dependent pick list very good okay dependent is no controlling is yes so remember these four points you can have a question from one of these okay so the controlling field will be merchandise type dependent field will be merchandise sub type vishalini are you following ikka okay good hit the continue button now So for audio, let's say I wanted to select speakers, Bluetooth speakers, wireless speakers with the include values. In the videos, let's say TV projector screen, and for phone accessories, I'm going to do phone charger and phone case, all these. So this is going to be the output. Hit the preview. So if the user selects audio, he'll only see three options. If the user selects video he will see these two options if the user selects phone accessories he will see these four options okay so now that that's good we're going to hit the save button so this is what our field the dependencies is so if you go back here if you click on audio then only it will display all these if you click on video then it will display these two if you click on phone accessories you have these four things 
Any questions so far? Okay. What's the next? No. Okay. So next thing. Anybody needs a break? Okay, now we're going to go ahead and do something called as a formula field. Okay, so a formula field enables a method to automatically calculate a value which you can obtain from other values and you can store in the Salesforce. So let's say by default, let's say if you if you go to the invoices, there is a field called as open date. Okay. Now you can by default set a value here, right? Today's date can be considered as an open date. So that is so the formula fields are read-only fields which will be calculated based upon the uh, based upon the other fields value. So let's say we have a requirement here where we calculate, we add a couple of fields on the merchandise object. Okay, let's say on the merchandise object, view merchandise object, we have a field called cost price and a selling price. Let's say we have and both of them are currency types. Okay, we have created two fields, cost price and selling price on the merchandise object. Then the profit we can calculate, right? Profit we can calculate based on this. We can calculate the profit based on this. We can calculate something like cost price, so, sorry, selling price minus cost price multiplied by 100 becomes the profit. Okay, becomes the profit. So this is what is a formula. And it is a read-only field because you are not allowed to enter any value because the value is automatically calculated because once you provide the cost price and the selling price, automatically the profit will be calculated. So this becomes a formula field. A formula field enables a method to automatically calculate a value that is obtained from other fields or values inside of the Salesforce CRM. So let's go ahead and create a formula field. So how we will do it? So first of all, we are going to add two different fields here on the merchandise object. So let's go back here, go to the view fields, create a new field here. Let's go ahead and create a new field. I hope I'm not going too slow. Uh, currency, let's say we go ahead and next button. Field label, let's say selling price. Hit the next button, visible to all, next, and hit the save. Then we're going to go ahead and add another field here, which is called as the another currency. And uh, next, it will be the cost price, let's say. I think we already have a price field, I think so. Yeah, so let's consider this price as the cost price. Okay, let's consider this price as the cost price and we already have something called as a selling price. So now we are going to go ahead and add a field called the profit and that will be cal profit percentage and that will be calculated based on the selling price minus the price multiplied by 100. So here you can go ahead and create a field. And what it is that it's going to be a formula field, right? It's a read-only field that derives the value from a formula expression that you have defined. And the formula field is updated when 
the source fields change. So if the value of the cost price or selling price change, automatically the profit value will also change. Okay, and it is a read only field. So whenever you put your record in edit mode, this formula field will not be appearing because you cannot edit this field. Let's say it's a read only field. So let's go ahead and hit the next button. Field label is profit percent. Okay, field name is this one. So what is the return type guys? What will be the return type here? Percent. Okay, the return type is going to be a percent. You can select, okay, uh, decimal places, whatever decimal places you want to put it. And what will be the profit percent equals to? It will be equal to, let me put a brackets here. So insert field. So the field is going to be selling price operator minus what is the type the price there is the price field very good and then multiply by 100 so this is going to be a profit percent okay and uh, you want to add a help test And next, visible. So the visible checkbox means you will be able to visible and read only. And then save. So now if I go to merchandise and if I provide the value of, let's say the merchandise item is Headphones price is let's say hundred dollars quantity is let's say Nothing let's say and then we have a audio let's speak And then selling price is equals to 200 hit the save buttons Automatically the profit percentage got calculated that is equals to why is it that much? Oh, divided by. Yeah, divided. The percentage calculation formula was not right. Yeah, formula was not right. Yeah, let me let me go back. Why didn't you guys tell me the time when I was creating the formula? Yeah, it was like <laughs> it was multiplying by hundred. Multiplying <laughs> by hundred was like I was. Why you are doing that? Yeah. Should be divided. Divided by cost price, multiply by 100, right? Oh. Yeah, yeah, divide by cost price yeah. and multiply by 100. That's what I think. Something is not right. Let's do this. Okay, syntax looks good, hit the save button. Now let's go ahead and see if the percent amount changed. Two hundred minus hundred divided by hundred, that is two hundred percent. Hundred percent, okay. Okay, so that's gonna be a price increase now. Okay, so if you want to do it, you can do it. Right now the formula is right, right? Yeah, so it calculated a percent change of 10,000 because we have, it's a percent. Okay, that's why. So this is how you create a formula field. Do you know how to create a formula field now? Does anybody know what is the character and size limits on the formula fields? Means how much, how big text you can create in the formula fields? Oh, it's 250. 250? Not the words, characters. Characters. Yeah. 
uh, it, it, if it's over 250, then you should go for visual page. I think it's 3,900 characters. 3,900 characters. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now let's create another one. And uh, so what they're saying here is there should always be some best, best practices when you are uh, creating a formula field. So because since there is a limitation on how much content you can add it in a formula field, so they're always asking you for creating a, using a best practices. So let's say if you wanted to create a, um, let's say we wanted to have a field called taxes, okay, sales tax, okay. And depending upon which state we are uh, we are in, we have a different tax percentage. Okay, so let's say if the if we are in California, then we'll say it's about 0.925. If you are in, in Nevada, it's different tax. If you're in Texas, there is a different amount of uh, tax. So the formula will look something like this. So if we have, let's say, the formula would be. If the state that we are in, so if the state that we are in is Texas, let's say, then what we have, the state we are in is Texas, and then what we are going to do is then then the uh, the the tax amount is let's say we have nine uh, percent. Okay, so if you are using this if conditions to formulate a formula field, then this might go big. So if you say if this is, then you can say if the state is equals to California. then let's say the percent is 10%, okay? And if you go for another, so if you keep doing that, it will kind of increase up to, let's say if you have Utah, then it might have a different percentage is equals to, let's say, 7%. So if the if the state is Texas, if the state is California, and if the state is Utah. So instead of doing something like this, there is a function available called case, okay? There's another function called case. Case is basically if the case state value is equals to, California, then automatically it will be 10%. If it's Utah, it will be 7%. So basically, this is the one of the best practice because here you're using more characters to create a formula. This is like an easier way of doing the same thing. It's going to give you the same result. But this is like because since we have a limitation and once if you're able, if you're trying to create a formula where you have exceeded the limit, then it is going to give you an error and you won't be able to save that formula field until or unless you change the, to kind of optimize it. Do you want me to create this one or no? Or did you understand what I'm talking here? Sorry, it okay. was not a follow. Okay, so what I'm saying here is, this is just an example. As I said, there is a limitation on how many characters you can put it in your formula fields. Okay, that's a 3,900 characters can only be there in the formula fields. So you have to make sure you do not use those many characters when you're creating your formula fields. So let's give, let me give you an example here. So let's say if you are, I'm, I'm, I don't want to explain this as an example because it'll take me time to add those fields and add those, those kind of things. So I just want to give you an overview here. So let's say there is a field on merchandise and the field name is called of sales tax. Okay, we have added a field called sales tax on our object called merchandise. And how the sales tax is calculated, it's a formula field. And how it is calculated, it is calculated based on this. So if, if the product that you're selling is in state of California, if the state, there's a, another field called state, assume there's a field called state on merchandise object. If the state you're selling the product in is in California, then how much is going to be the tax? Let's say the, the tax amount would be, uh, it would be, let's say, 9%, okay? It will be 9%. Similarly, then you are going to say if something like this, if state is equals to Utah, then it is going to be equals to, let's say 10%. If this is the uh, percentage, if this is the sales tax in the case. So you will keep going like this, okay? You'll keep going like this and covering all the state. If state is equals to Texas, then percent is equals to 8%. So this way what happens is you might easily fill, uh, you might all easily exceed the formula limit. So what we have, there is an, another option available called case. That's another, like if, you, if you're from Java background, you might know switch case, right? So there is another formula that we can use. Instead of using if statements, you can use something like as case statements. Okay, you can use something like as case statements. So how will that work? 
you don't have to specify um, you don't have to specify like this you can just say case merchandise state whatever this the state field is if the state if the state is equals to so what is the case number one case number one is California then automatically use nine percent then the case number two let's say um, this is another state we can say is Texas then use the percentage as seven so this is like you're saying the same thing instead of using if else you're using a case statement so the case is better when you're talking about if. So what that is what they're recommending. So whenever you're using something like if if this, then do this, if this, like in the case of formula field, then you, instead of using if, you should use something called as case. Case is also doing the same thing. Do you get my point here? Yes. Okay. So that is why they're saying that as an admin, system admin, you need to be very careful about, uh, you need to be very careful about using the formula fields and not exceeding the limits of the formula. Okay, so uh, okay. what we have done so far, we have done is formula field, we have done lookup relationship, master detail relationship, and then we have also done about the, we haven't done the role of summary, okay, and then we haven't done the, we have done the validation rules. So let's say, now let's talk about role up summary fields. Now, can somebody tell me what roll-up summary is? Yeah, this is uh, uh, you, you can calculate. Yeah. You can have a, okay. Somebody else is talking. No, no, you go ahead. Yeah, you can calculate the, the uh, you know, something, the any number field like in quantity or, uh, or um, uh, price or percentage or something from child field to a parent field and you know show up either you can count it or you can sum it up okay or okay. minimum or maximum okay so uh, in what case this role you can create roll up summary on any object you want only on parent so you can create roll up summary in um, which kind of relation both the relationships master parent, only master detail exactly Okay. So let's say the role of summary field is a field basically to summarize the data into the child from the child object into the parent object. So the, will the role of summary field will be only available in the parent or it will be added on the child object? Only on the parent. Okay. Only parent. Okay. And so the role of summary field is only available. So let's say my requirement is this. My requirement is on the invoice object, on the invoice object, I wanted to calculate the total uh, of all the line items. Okay, number of line items, let's say. How many line, how many items are there with this invoice? Yeah. Okay, something like yes. that. So this roll of summary is, items. yeah, so we are going to go ahead and count these line items. Let's say if I wanted to calculate the maximum price of the line item. You can do that by saying, okay, maximum price of the uh, line item associated with that. Okay. So in roll up summary is only available in case of master detail relationship. That is the first point. And it is only available, it makes sense to be added on the parent object. So in the case of invoice and line items, invoice is the parent object. So the roll up summary field will be added on the parent object. And this roll up summary is only only for the master detail relationship. It is not available in the case of lookup relationship. So if you go to the, if you go to the, um, let's go back here and let me go to the invoice object. Let's first go to the line items. And if I'm trying to add a field here called role of summary, I won't be able to do it. It's graded out. Okay. It's graded out. It's a read only field that displays the sum minimum or maximum value of a field in the related list. So as I already told you, related list is nothing but the relationship that particular object has with other object that becomes the related list or the record count of all the record listed in the related list. So if you wanted to get a head count of how many line items are associated with this invoice, you can do that. If you wanted to calculate the maximum price of that line item, you can do that. If you wanted to calculate the average, you can do that. If you want to calculate the minimum of the line items price, you can do that. So basically, it summarizes the data 
from the related list. It is only available in the case of parent object, only in the case of master detail relationship. So if you go to the invoice here, and if you try to create a new field, then you will see a field called rollup summary is not graded out here. It is available to select and then hit the next button. And let's say I wanted to calculate the name of the field is number of line items. Let's say I make it a little number of nine items and hit the next button. So what you want to do, these are the four options. Count, Count. minimum or maximum. So this is going to be what fields you want. Summarized object should be what? There's only one available. It's a line item. What do you want to do? Do you want it to count it? Yes, you want it to count it. If you choose one of these options, then you have to specify which field do you want it to sum. Do you want it to sum the quantity field? Do you want it to calculate the minimum of which fields? Because if there is four line items available, mm -hmm. so which and each of the line items has these four columns, then which field minimum value do you want? So based on that. So there is only going to select count. All records should be included in the calculation. Only records meeting the criteria should be included in the calculation. So let's say if you only want a specific line items to be considered in the count, then you can specify the condition here. Otherwise, you can just specify all the records should be included. Hit the next button. Visible to all. Next. And then hit the save button. So now, if you go to the invoices, and if you click on one of these invoices, right now, how many line items are there? Zero, because there is no line items available under this particular invoice. Now, as soon as you start to add line items here, let's say the first line item I'm adding, and merchandise is, we have speakers, hit the save button. Similarly, if I go ahead and add another line item, let me go to the same invoice and add another line item here. Then what we have done is, let's say the line item number two, it is related to laptop, hit the save button. So how many are there? So it is rolling up the data. So if you go to the invoices, it's only available on the parent object. If you roll up the data, you will see the number of line items are two. So this is what we have is a roll up summary. Any questions, guys? I'm fine. Okay. Okay, now the next thing is I wanted to go ahead and give you some, so we have covered relationships today. There is a many to many relationship left, which we will cover in the next one. But I wanted to give you more information on the standard objects that we were discussing yesterday. So this, so now we are, we are considering small, small topics just for the remaining interval. It might exceed 12 o'clock, but just, I just wanted to wrap it up what I was supposed to cover today. So let me go back here. Deepika, we can only have uh, 10 roll-up summaries, right, per object, not more than that? Yeah. Okay. So if at all we try to add it and it's going to gray out? Yeah, it's not going to allow us to do that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's go back. Let me pull up something. Okay, one thing I was talking about, do you know how many types of tabs we have available? Anybody knows how many types of tabs we have available? Do you know? What are different types of tabs? Web tabs we have and then the normal tabs. Very good. And then there's a three different types of tabs. Custom tabs. Custom tabs are so we have uh, custom tabs. Web tabs. Web tabs. Third one, which VF tabs, not Visual Force tabs. Very good. So we have these are the different types of tabs that we have. Okay. So one is called as the uh, web tabs. Web tabs is basically let's say you wanted to add a tab and you wanted to link to a different URL. That is a web tab. Visual Force tab is basically the 
if you have created a visual force page a custom visual force page visual force is something that is it's a, it's a scripting language with which we create our custom ui okay if you wanted to have a tab for that then there's a visual force tabs you can create and there's a lightning page tabs so basically when you're talking about lightning that's what the lightning page tabs are so web tabs are easy to create it's, let's say i wanted to create a tab in my warehouse and it should take me to the website okay it should take me to my website let's say so if i go ahead and create a new it's asking me what type of it full page width or two column two columns means you will be able to see the sidebar here and then full width means you're only going to see your your url hit the next button let's say the name of my tab is my tutorial rack okay let's say this is the name of my tab and i pick a tab style let's say the style i pick up is bell and uh, let's say hit the next button now if you wanted to take this particular url to a different website okay so let's say i wanted to go ahead and copy my website here i can select this and i can paste it hit the next button and this particular tab i wanted to make it visible to all these profiles hit the next button and i wanted to include this tab in my warehouse application so what will happen is hit the save button so this is a web tab i'm explaining so you will see a my tutorial rack tab got added once you click on it you will see my website information here let me let me go back it should it should do that so if you go to the tabs if you click on tabs here and if you click on edit tab full page width Let me make it HTTPS. Let's say preview tab. Okay, so now it's showing up. So okay, the so preview tab, and then hit the save button. So what will happen is now if I go to this particular tab, you will see my website here. Okay, you will see a snapshot of my website. Okay, you'll see this. So this is a web tab. Another point here is so we have three different types of tab: custom tabs. then you have is the web tab and then you have a visual force tab visual force tab when you create your own visual force page you can create a tab associated with that particular visual force page similarly if let's say as a user if you want to customize the tabs that you want to make it visible to you so there is two ways one is like so there are two ways show and hiding the tabs so one way is through a profile right through a profile you can control what all tabs are visible to a particular user but there is another way let's say as a user as just as me i want to customize what i do like when i enter to salesforce what tabs should i see under each application so let's say if as an admin i am more concerned into the posts and dashboards on of all applications then i do not need extra tabs so what i can do is i can go to my settings and i can change the display and layout and i can customize my tabs here okay and here i can say that for this warehouse application or uh, these are the tabs i am interested in see okay i do not want to see my tutorial rack so we're going to move it back so you can specify for you not this will only change the look and feel of your own when you log in but it's not going to affect any other person so this is the way you can display you can change your you can customize your tabs based on under which application which particular tabs you are going to see okay so which particular tabs you are going to see under which application so that is controlled by under your settings my settings and then customize my tabs under the display and layout so here you can specify that okay i do not want to see solutions i do not want to see cases you can select which tab you do not want so then if you go to that particular sales application you will not no longer will be seeing solutions tab here or the cases tab here okay so this is another way that you can uh, hide your tabs other than your uh, other than your uh, profiles now another thing that we have is renaming the labels for the standard tabs so a lot of times if you as a system admin you will you will see that if you are logged into a company um, and this company is let us related to hospitality business or something so their accounts does not make sense they have their own uh, they have their own tab where the accounts should be called as let's say clients okay 
and let's say opportunities instead of saying uh, opportunities we wanted to call it as uh, deals okay so how we can do that there's another way that we can also rename the labels for the standard tags as well so how we will do we'll go to the setup we will go to the customize section here we go to the tabs so you can see here there is a rename tabs and labels button available okay so here let's say if what will happen is if you wanted to instead of displaying uh, accounts you want to display something else so make a salesforce match your organization's terminology by renaming the tab and the field labels okay so you can use this and automatically what will it do it will let's say i want to change from accounts to clients let's say singular is client and plural is clients and does not start with the vowel then what will happen is automatically it will whatever was earlier called account division it will change it to client division account name it will change it to client name it will do all these things but there are certain fields for which you cannot change it let's say last modified date you cannot change it you cannot change the field label of the last modified date or created by because those are the fields that are need for the tracking purpose so they do not allow you the salesforce does not allow you to change the labels for those kind of fields but other than that see you can rename the tabs and labels for the account object or for whatever object that you want and so here it automatically it will change it to their corresponding so instead of saying account box uh, access it will say client access so hit the save button so once you do that now you no longer see clients up here you see no longer see accounts you see clients and when you go ahead and look at the fields now there is not saying account name they are saying client name client number client site so you can customize it based upon on your organizations okay similarly if you wanted to change for opportunities you can do that you can go to the setup and you can look for something called as tabs and uh, go to the tabs here you can rename the tabs and the labels but there are only certain restrictions you can see these are the only object for which you can change it you do no longer see i think there is no home tab you cannot change the name for the home tab you do not see reports also so reports cannot also not be changed i think yeah so those are few of the objects for which you cannot change the rename the tabs but for most of them you can do it so if i wanted to go ahead and re reverse it i can just go back here and i change it to account and make it back to accounts here hit the next button and then automatically it will revert it back and hit the save button here Okay, so for tabs like home, chatter, forecast, reports, and dashboards, those are the tabs you cannot change it. Okay, and also the fields like created by and last modified by, they are also prevented from being renamed because those are audit fields and they are used for tracking the system information. So these two fields are also not allowed to change, which is one is the created by and the other the one is the last modified by and which objects are not allowed one we have is a chatter forecast reports and dashboards okay remember these names because they might ask you and another thing is you can have up to 200 custom objects created under the enterprise edition and you can have up to 2000 under the unlimited edition okay so there's a number here 200 for the if you are in the 200 for custom objects can be created in the enterprise edition and how many objects are created 2000 are created under the unlimited edition okay i don't think so this number you have to remember but i'm just giving you and uh, object limits there's another thing we have is called the object limit so every object limit is basically let's say i wanted to see what is my limitations on every object so let's say if you are under wanted to see the limitation on the account object so there is a place called limits this will give you how much limitation you have on everything so you these limits apply to the setup of the object in the organization some of limits vary by what object is it is it a standard is it a custom and so this is what the limits are so you have an option of creating 500 custom fields on this account object 
you are only using seven custom fields you have remaining of about i don't know 493 okay so these are the this is the usage limit you can go ahead and look at the limits of each of the objects so if you wanted to go for the uh, opportunity you can go ahead and look at the limits for that particular object as well so these are the opportunities this is the usage what is the limit and what percentage you have used all that information so you can see that one as well okay any questions so far no dipika okay um, then next thing we have is the um, tracking um, then we have is the um, history tracking so let's say i wanted to um, so I wanted to make sure that I wanted to see that some of the fields, uh, I wanted to track and the values of those field changes. Okay, how can I do that? That is done through the field history tracking. So let's say if you go to the account object, let's say I wanted to make sure, let's say if any time anybody changes the revenue amount on the account object, let's say if anybody wants, anybody changes the revenue amount of the account, uh, account object, I want to do, know that who changed what. Okay, so you can do that as well by going to the setup. You can say what is that? There's the feed tracking. Field. History tracking. Where is it? Uh, I'm trying to look. Field. That's what I was looking for. Field history. I think I have to go to the account object probably. Deepika, I think while creating the object, we'll have that option. No? We enable field history tracking. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Go to the account object. Go to the fields. Set history tracking. Yeah. Yeah, sorry about it. Okay, so now we have history tracking here. So let's say here you wanted to enable some of the fields that you wanted to capture what was the old value and what was the new value. You can do it for the some of the fields, but for some of the fields, you can only track the changes like a text field, okay, text area field, like description. Like when you have a larger text, uh, like a text area kind of a field type, then you won't be able to track the old and the new value. You will be able to track something like, okay, uh, this value changed. That's it. But for these values on the account object, you can check, okay, this was the previous number, this is the new number. So if somebody changes the employees or somebody changes the annual revenue, then I wanted to track it, okay? Then I wanted to track it. So if I go ahead, you select those check boxes, whichever field you want to track. So anytime annual revenue changes or anytime the number of employees changes, this will track it. So once you go ahead and hit the save button, you will be able to, once you change the account, information you will be able to see the uh, you'll be able to see that what changed so there is no account history but let me know uh, okay so first let's say we change the uh, um, let's change the revenue to three thousand and let's change the employees also let's do, let's say to five okay uh, and let's hit the save button so what will happen is it will tell us that so and so person has changed the um, has changed the value of the annual revenue so somebody tell me why don't I see it right now? If you know it, that's fine. But if you do not know it, can you make a guess? Why don't we see that? Okay, um, hey, somebody somebody changed the value of the annual revenue and employees, and I do not see it. It's it's not on the layout, I guess. Exactly, it's not on the layout. Okay. So did you get my question? See, first what we did is we wanted to track who changed what. That is called as history tracking. Okay. If you wanted to make sure that these are the fields that got changed. And these, this is the person and some of this let's feel like revenue, revenue related or number of employees related, all those kind of things. And if you wanted to track those, then for every object, you can enable the history tracking. Just like if you go to a custom object also, let's say we go to our uh, invoice object and anything like that, we can change, we can uh, add the history tracking on that one. So let's say if you go to the invoice and let me go to the view fields here. And if you go to the add the history tracking here, let's say anytime somebody changes the amount on the invoice, I should get, I should be notified. Okay, so we can go ahead and add this field. 
So what will happen is every time you change the amount on the invoice. Okay, so if I go back here and if I go ahead and change the amount on the invoice, let's go ahead and change the amount to, let's say, 500. Hit the Save button. What will happen is I should be notified. The reason I'm not getting notified is because of the layout. So what, what we will do, we will go ahead and edit the layout here. And under the layout, we will go to something called as a related list. And you will see something as invoice history. Okay. So go ahead and drag that particular field and put it one of the places like this. So you have, you drag this invoice history, hit the save button. So now if you go back and go to your invoices, there is a thing got added called invoice history. And it will tell you that, okay, this particular person has changed the amount to $500. If you go back again and change it again to the, let's say, $1,500, then it will have the previous value as well as the new value also. So it will tell you, okay, the amount was $500. Now somebody changed from the $500 to $1,500 value. Okay? Does that make sense, guys? Okay, who has anybody, any questions so far? Deepika, no. the set is the tracking, it's not uh, enabled for few objects, right? For campaigns in order to not be available, right? So field history tracking is available for the objects like um, accounts, cases, contacts, contracts, lease and opportunity. Okay. Okay, for these objects it is enabled. Okay, okay. And you can have up to a maximum of 20 fields per object that you can set to track. Uh, we, can, we can track uh, custom up objects to, also, right? Yeah, we just did. We just did an invoice object and we also did an uh, account object. Oh, yeah. Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so we did on both. So in the case of the account object, if you go to the uh, sales and if you go to the account object, and I think we did not add it to the layout, so that's why we were not seeing it. So if you go ahead and edit the layout here, so let me go back inside of this object. Edit layout. There's a button called as under the related list. You will see something called as the account history. You just go ahead and drag it and drop it somewhere and then hit the save button. Then this time, if you go to the account object, you will see the whatever the change you made. Okay, so you will see there is an account history, and it will tell you you changed the employee to number five, you changed the revenue from this number to this number. So you have up to there is a maximum of twenty fields per object that can be set to track. And what all objects are there? There are a total of um, you can set the history tracking for accounts, cases, contacts, contracts, leads, and opportunity. Okay. And uh, another th thing to notify about is okay, so they're saying this field history data does not count against your organization's storage limit. So if you have bought a Salesforce certificate and there is a specific limit that you have, but field histories are not part of that storage. So even if you are, even if you have a lot of history, that will not be part, that not be considered as the storage or organization storage limit. But right now Salesforce is only keeping up 18 months of changes. It's not going, like not keeping all the history, all the field changes, only up till 18 months it is storing the information. Okay. And, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, let me see if I have missed anything for today. You know what related lists are. List views. Okay, so you know what list views is anything. So let's say if you have account object, these are nothing but the list views. So if you only want the accounts that are created by you, you can get a list of those views. If you wanted the views like how many you created last week, how many this week, all that stuff you can mention. You can also create your own view where we can add what fields do you want to see and uh, what are the, let's say you wanted to go ahead and create a name called Dipika view and uh, do you want it to display all the accounts 
Uh, or do you only want to display the accounts that are my accounts? You can display by the owner. You can see which fields you want to display. Let's say you're interested in um, website information and employees. You can also add those, select a particular field. Restrict the visibility. Do you only want it to restrict this view to yourself? It should be visible to all users or only to a certain group of users. So you can specify that. So this is basically your custom view of things that you want to see. So right now, you will see, once I have in the Deepika view, you will see more two more uh, fields like website and employees also. But if you change it to the all accounts, you no longer see those two different fields that we have added under your view. So view is nothing but the, the look and feel that you wanted to see for a particular object. And for each object, you can create a new view here. By clicking on this new view button here, you can create your own view. And every object in Salesforce, which is associated with a tab, automatically gets one list view at least, okay? If there is no tab set up for the object, then there will be no corresponding list view. So you, if, if a particular object has a tab, then you will also get at least one list view. Now you can also modify a list view, a list, uh, um, you can also modify a list view by using the filter criteria. So if you wanted to go ahead and edit a particular list view by only displaying the accounts greater than 5,000 revenue or something like that, you can always change it. So here you can say, um, instead of all accounts, if you wanted to go ahead and edit it, you can specify a filter criteria based on only show the fields which where you can say where the, let's say, annual revenue is greater than, let's say, 100,000, okay? So you can specify the filter criteria under that particular view. So you will only see those particular accounts where the revenue is greater than 100,000, okay? And if you wanted to go ahead and add that revenue field, you can do that by moving your revenue field on the right-hand side. So where is the revenue field? Okay, hit the right-hand side, hit the save button. So this time, if you go ahead and go to the accounts, okay, let me go ahead and edit. Right now, only see the revenue. So let's say you wanted to add all these fields along with the revenue. So now you will be able to see all the all the uh, accounts where the revenue is greater than three hundred thousand. So you can edit the view. You can filter what kind of data do you want to see. As long as if, if the object has a tab, it will get at least one list view. Now list view also have a print feature enabled. So you can see here there's a print feature enabled that can be used by you and the users around you. Um, and uh, you can click on this button and you'll get a print view of the things. So the print list, printable list views need to be enabled using the organization wide settings for the print features are there. So there is an organization wide setting that we will talk about later where you can set up your print view. Okay, so you, can, you, you will have this button only if you set up that under the organization settings. Okay, anything else guys? Yeah, so this is what I was planning on covering today. Um, there were some topics that I covered through the application, but they were small topics which I have to cover like individually, so I covered in the last 15 minutes. Any questions you have? I know um, somebody told me to cover the admin questions. I, I The questions that you sent, I'm, I'm gonna go through my, I'll find myself some admin questions and uh, we will cover that in the next tutorial. Uh, so I have that in mind that we have to cover questions as well. But this today I don't want to cover it because I have certain syllabus that I want to finish before we go to the next topic. So did you enjoy the class today? Was it something helpful? Did you learn something new or was it just a repetition of what you already know? No, no, yeah. It was, it was, it was, it was good. good. It was good, okay. Um, the pace was good? Yes. Okay, uh, Kiran, I, have, I, I know your husband sent me a request to change your email ID. Okay, I'll keep in mind. Um, any questions, guys, for today's? Deepika, when you'll be sending us the recording? Okay, I'll send you um, the recording by tonight or maybe tomorrow morning, but I'll send you tonight. It takes about an hour to convert the whole recording, and yesterday was a little okay. busy, so that's why. Another thing I wanted to do is, guys, Students who wanted to uh, clear the admin certification, I will request you guys to go through the trailhead stuff as well. There's a trailhead section in the admin, beginners, intermediate. So keep practicing that along with these video tutorials.
okay so that will help you to get your certification faster And uh, mm. uh, and another thing is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, will you be just emailing us the video recording, or is it there be a Google Drive? What? Uh, I will. Know? No, what I'm thinking is I'm going to make it a, on on available on YouTube, and I'm putting it as a private mode, so only you guys will be able to see it. Okay. Okay. Because if I do it Google Drive, it will be too much. So I'll just put it on a YouTube, and I'll send you the link of the playlist. Um, see, um, the, the um, Kiran, if you have those scenario-based questions. Um, actually, I wanted to practice on some, so I just wanted to know, like, if there is any real time which we can think of, like, we can work on. Like, real time, what we covered is a part of, like, we validation, no, validation, like, some complicated validation which you worked on in the real time. So if you can tell us the scenario, uh, like we will be working on on our off time, like no, when after the class. Mm -hmm. uh, next week is also fine. Like otherwise, you can email us. Just no, a complicated but, uh, one so that we can use our skills. Like we can debug, and next class we can be ready with okay. some complicated validation. And so have you have you gone through, through all the uh, trailhead uh, advanced section on the admin, like the intermediate and the beginner section on the trailhead? Have you, have you gone through those? Okay, advanced section, okay, I didn't see that, okay. Yeah, there's a, there's a three section, beginner, intermediate, and advanced. If you have already gone through beginner and intermediate, then you can go through the advanced as well. Oh, okay, I okay. went through beginner and advanced. Yeah, and another thing I have is let's, guys, um, is these uh, Salesforce forums. So if you go to the Salesforce forums, you will see a lot of uh, questions related to UI or account managers. Try to answer those uh, on the forums. That will also kind of help you out the learning. And that's like the places where Salesforce people hang out. And if they come across any issues, you can go ahead and search them. That will kind of also give you a lot of practice. This is all about practice. The more you do it, more you're going to, especially the development, it's more about practice. So people who are new to programming here, if anybody is like completely beginner in programming, then I will recommend you to uh, start with this Apex workbook. It's a, this is a long workbook, but you should go ahead and go through this workbook. Uh, it's a one. There's one which is like a huge 4,000 pages. Apex developer guide, I think, yeah. So that is, I would recommend you guys, if you, especially for people who are completely beginners, because people who have no programming skills, it will be a little hard for them. So you need to brush up your programming, go through some what is done in this. So I'll recommend you to start with reading this book and try to go through some examples on the site. So that is another uh, thing I will suggest to you. So people who wanted to prepare for admin certification, the trailhead is the best place to start with. Um, I also have a book that I'm going through right now. It's this admin handbook but that particular book mm -hmm. is like uh, the topics are not covered in a in a flow they are just covered by topic by topic wise like one thing at a time so there is no relation between what's the previous so that's a book for a reference but i want to just recommend you to go through and depend on that one trailhead is for people who wanted to get to admin if somebody is here in the class who is from is anybody from non-programming background me deepika Michelle. Okay, well, how about others? Anybody else? Um, okay. It's been ages since I programmed. <laughs> so it's been ages? Okay. It's like I have to brush up. Yeah, so I would recommend you guys, anybody who wants, please go start reading this workbook guide. Go through, I don't, don't get demotivated by the amount of lectures, the amount of topics, but at least refresh yourself. So it'll, because we won't be spending too much time on learning the basics. So I wanted to get straight into the Salesforce development. So I want you to make sure that you are, we will cover the basics for sure, but we're not going to spend too much time in just the basics. So if, we, if you're reading on the site, it will help me as well as you to understand things. And once you are, once you have already have some information, then you'll come up with questions also on, on. so it'll be more, more, it'll be better for both of us. So go through this book, especially if you're a non-programmer, start reading it. 
and go through the uh, Nick, please go through the trailhead materials. That is a good place to start for your admin preparation. Anything else? For development, we should go through this 4,000 pages. Typical. No, <laughs> no, not go through the 4,000 pages, but uh, at least in like, uh, like what is a class, what is a variable, what are different data types, what are loops, what is a nested loop, what is a for loop, all those kind of things. And you can, what, what usually I do is, since there's not much material on the, um, Example. So I pick up some examples from Java and on my practice, for my practice, and I try to do the same examples using Apex. Let's say you are trying to create a for loop. You can use some examples from Java, and you can write those similar ones using Apex. This is what I do. Okay. So let's say you are creating a UI, like a button and all that. You can get some examples by looking at some website and okay, try to create something small, like just practice, just practice. Try in getting in habit of writing code. That's what my main point is. Getting in the habit of writing code. Okay? Okay. It's not something that you're going to start with and hey, you're seeing, hey, what this is she's doing. I have no I want you to have a little bit idea on what you're going to do once you jump into programming. If admin is okay, it's, it's more about learning about the tool. Problem is most of people have is in the development. So I want you to have brush up your skills when you go into that section. What is the final keyword? We'll cover those, but you know what I'm saying, right? Yeah, I can understand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so yeah, don't don't worry about the 4,000 pages, but try to read it. And if it's like, 3,000 pages, don't worry. Yeah. It's 1,000 yeah. less. <laughs> yeah. So so it's like um, you, you have one week to do to do stuff, right? So you can just every day two hours will be enough. So that once we reach to the development, you have good understanding of uh, Deepika, I have one question for admin certification. I have finished my trailhead uh, beginners and mm -hmm. I'm doing intermediate. So do mm -hmm. I have to do uh, advanced also? I think advanced is for the advanced admin, right? Yeah, so if I am done with... Um, yeah, beginner and intermediate. Will beginner and intermediate, yeah. I should be okay. And I'm doing developer also side by side. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that would be good. Uh, developer one also. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll find some, some like, like questions for the real time um, for like somebody asked me for real time. I'll try to find and put it together so that you can do it like practice validation rules and something like that. But I'll do it. Tomorrow. Yeah. If if you can give something uh, some like va validation rules based on like uh, the standard uh, objects like accounts and contacts and leads and opportunities. You know they're already built there. We can practice on those. Okay, so let me give you this example. Remember we were talking about this uh, case, the state case? So yeah. try to create, let me give you an overview what we are supposed to do. Try to create, let's say this is on account object, okay? And let's say on, if you go to the account object, what kind of fields we have? Is there a field related to state? Do you see any field related to state? Yes, uh, shipping, ship, uh, the state there. Where, where, where? Shipping where? state. Shipping, shipping street, the state. Yeah, right yeah, so what you can do Sorry. is, let me, let, me, let me do it. So you can just select that, okay? You can use some values and create a formula field and put a field called taxes here. Either you can create it here or either you can do it in merchandise, whichever you're comfortable with. And try to create a formula field using if, if condition as well as using the case statements. And if you do not understand what I'm talking, if you do not understanding the answer, you don't know how to do it, you Google it. Google the answer. Okay. okay? Because when you Google things, you're going to find five more things that you have to learn. So that's how you will understand. So first mm -hmm. thing, what, what, what my requirement is this. You have to calculate the taxes. So you add based it. On the state. Yeah, based on the state. Okay, so automatically, if it's Texas, you can put whatever percent you want, doesn't matter. But use it with the formula field using if statement and then use it with the case. Okay, similarly, for a validation rule, let me think about something so that I can help you. Merchandise. 
So you mark down that assignment, okay? Uh, what are the pick list? You can go through the pick list and see. Um, let me see here. In the merchandise quantity should not be one you can create as quantity should be greater than one always. Okay, you should not be empty. And uh, you can do one of this one that's a very small one though. Uh, then and selling price should not be less than cost mm, price, something like that. that. Is all the, yeah, that is another one. That is another one. Okay. And then on the another one that I had is if you go to the uh, invoices, add a field, formula field again, which will basically calculate. So add a field called under the. Uh, so let me let me think about it. So you have a so in an in invoices, I wanted to have a field for total amount. Okay. Yeah. Total amount. For all the total amount, and that should be equals to the line items. The price. Okay. Line items price. So you have to add a field here, quantity as well as the price. So, okay. So first thing is on the line items, there will be two fields. One will be the price for each line item and the quantity. And there's another field called total price. That will be basically the price of quantity multiplied by the price of each invoice. And then on the invoices, you will roll up that total amount field on this line item. Are you getting my point? So let me write it down. So the first assignment that you're going to do is use the formula field to calculate. calculate. Okay. Is one. Second one is the quantity field on the the quantity field on the line items should be always be greater than one. Okay, the next one is add two fields. One is the price field and another one is the total price field on the line item object. Okay, and the total price would be equals to price multiplied by quantity. Okay, total price would be equals to price multiplied by quantity. And the next thing we have is one, two, three. And then roll up summary would be there. Will, you will add a roll up summary field on what? On an invoice object called as total amount, which will be equals to total the sum the sum of the sum of the total price price on the line item. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, this is their, then what else? Let me think about this. So these are the four questions I have so far. Let me think what else we can come up with. Mm -hmm. Guys, think, think. New, which is next price, selling price, quantity. Yeah, there's another one. Somebody said selling price should be greater than the cost price. That's a validation rule. You can add that. Yes. That's an easy one. Uh, yeah, so, so far I have these. So do you want me to email it to you? Uh, can you go back? Um, mm -hmm. Merchandise um, object, can you go back there, uh, Deepika? Merchandise, yeah. Okay, what do you want me to do? Open, open uh, yeah. And we can do, no, date is not there. We can uh, have the, where we have dates on invoice, yeah. No, invoice that be on invoice, right? We can do some date, like close. We already did close date, should be greater than open date. No, oh, okay. We already did that, right? Close date should be greater than open yeah. date. And you can also create something like a, a number of days open for, so you can calculate. No, look, like, Close date yeah, that we can do, but other than that, we uh, what about if the close date, uh, if we uh, the pick list has closed date, the close date value should not be null or something like that. We did that, right? We did that. Yeah. Okay. If the if the if the status yeah, yeah. is equals to uh, close, then the close date should not be blank. Remember? And 
Uh, can you um, yeah, negotiate? See, see here? Yeah. yeah. Uh, what else? Oh, I was looking for something. Uh, can we do something there where the same merchandise um, items should not be, they should be unique? If you make it, it would be easy, I guess. Unique and required, then. Yeah, yeah. Right. The merchandise items can be there. there it, it can, it should not. It, it doesn't need to be unique, you know. So many invoices for yeah. one merchandise you, you can sell to so many people. Or even one person can buy one thing mm -hmm. any time. Yeah, but merchandise is like a master list, right, of all the things that you have. We shouldn't have repeated. Repeated, like in, in, a, in a merchandise, you shouldn't be having two uh, same two items. Laptops. Yeah, for example, laptop can be two, but but like exact same brand, we shouldn't have two, right? Why? Why not? You can just make it as unique. So how will you make it as unique? That's my question. Uh, Doesn't it need to know the previous records and the new records in order to make sure that the records are not repeated? How will you how will you compare this record with this record? See, you're not acting on one record. Uh, you are acting on yeah, two different yeah. records. Like, how will you make sure yeah. that this record is not the same as this record? You can't do that. Okay, with validation. We need to you can't do, the, do that. Validation. Yeah, we you can't, can't do that. Can't do proofs. Yeah, you can't do those. Yeah, things. we. Yeah, we have to do uh, a workflow thing for this. Yeah, thing. yeah, or something like other than that. But you cannot do it through the, either through validation. You cannot validate that the name is not duplicated here. No, you can't do that. Uh, I think so far I've come across, I might find something, but yeah, try to do these five. Let me write it down, email you guys. No, I'm just wondering if we created a master detail relationship, then mm -hmm. if you are selecting merchandise and the laptop is the master and, uh, you know, so in a merchandise uh, object, the laptop uh, should be like there should be only one record for laptop and then I don't know how, maybe I'm confused right now. Go back and think. Okay. So you're going to go back and think. No, the, I mean, <laughs> the thing is, no, no, the ID will be unique for it, right? Yeah, ID is going to be unique for every record. Okay? Yeah, ID is so going to be unique. That shouldn't, yeah. But what I'm saying is that you cannot put in the same description, like the same item again, even if the item is unique. So yeah, you can do item. something like, hey, if you have five HP laptop, you just bump up the quantity of that instead of having five different five different rows for five of those laptops, right? You should not do, you should basically do something like, okay, HP laptops, we have five of those. And if you have those, that's the better way of doing it. But you can't, you can't, Make sure it is unique only by using a validation rule or something, or like a formula. You can't do that. So who else is left here? No shame, Sakina, Kiran. Who else is left in this one? Kiran. Yeah, it's uh, Sai Kiran. You can search on SCI. Okay. Anybody else left? Yeah. The third one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. Who else? No, we, including you, we are six here. <laughs> no, as I was saying, there was somebody with those, I was sending it to her husband instead of, okay, so that's all. Oh. Okay, that was, I think you. Okay, sorry. Okay. Any, any more questions? Okay, guys, then I will see you next weekend and I'll send you the recordings. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.